any questions you have at the end. I would like to begin by introducing Michelle Gabriel, Public Health Administrator for the Knox County Health Department. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I would like to start by re reiterating information shared yesterday by the Illinois Department of Public Health. There are currently 160 cases in Illinois of diagnosed COVID-19. Yesterday, sadly, Illinois announced the first death in the state from COVID-19. This is something that individuals across the state responding to this event hoped would never occur in Illinois. Additionally, on Saturday, Illinois reported its first COVID-19 case in a long-term care facility. Yesterday, it was deemed an outbreak after responding entities tested all residents and staff and the number of individuals positive for COVID-19 at the DuPage, Illinois facility grew an additional 21 individuals, 17 residents and four staff. These occurrences are reminders of why it's so important in Knox County for all individuals to remain vigilant in the practice of hand washing, covering coughs and sneezes, washing your hands, staying home when you're sick, and practicing appropriate social distancing in order to limit the spread of the virus locally and across the state and nation. Locally, six individuals have been tested for COVID-19 virus, two have resulted in negative results, and four are pending. Both local hospitals and the health department have been testing, have testing available and are testing both through the state health department lab as well as commercial laboratories. Locally here in Knox County, Illinois, we have no confirmed cases of COVID-19. However, community partners are still actively taking steps necessary to protect the health of Knox County. Education of our community is a priority, as is communication and cooperation between our partners. That is why Knox County is announcing that it has opened its emergency operations center and initiated a uniform, unified command response against the COVID-19 virus. At this time, I would like to introduce the agencies and the representing individuals participating in this response. Knox County Emergency Management Agency, represented by Randy Hovind, Emergency Management Agency Coordinator and Galesburg Fire Chief, Galesburg Police Department, represented by Russ Idle, Chief of Police, Knox County Sheriff Department, represented by David Clegg, Knox County Sheriff, Regional Office of Education number 33, represented by Jody Scott, Regional Superintendent of Schools, Galesburg Community Unit School District 205, represented by John Asplund, Superintendent. Galesburg Fire Department, represented by Brad Stevenson, Deputy Chief. Galesburg Hospitals Ambulance Service, represented by Mike Howard, Director of Operations. Galesburg Cottage Hospital, represented by Bob Moore, CEO. OSF St. Mary Medical Center, represented by Lisa DeCaswell, President. City of Galesburg Public Works, represented by Wayne Carl, Director of Planning and Public Works, and the Knox County Health Department, represented by myself, Michelle Gabriel, Public Health Administrator. We are fortunate to have these partners in our community working together for the health and safety of the Knox County community. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce Randy Hovind, Knox County Emergency Management Agency Coordinator and Galesburg Fire Chief. Good morning, everyone. I just kind of want to give you a brief statement uh, uh, with what we're doing. We've assembled a team, like we talked about, uh, and we're doing a partial activation of the uh, Emergency Operations Center right now as per our operation guidelines, the Emergency Operation Plan guidelines. Uh, and we're going to be operating by that plan from now on. The purpose of the plan is to function as one group instead of individual pieces. We're meeting as a team daily to discuss where needs may be. This can encompass anything from medical needs, information needs, and community needs. It encompasses everything. Uh, if we need to have them, we have volunteers from both municipalities and from the county, and, and this is really all about community. 
There are many service groups who have already said that they're ready to step up to the plate and help when needed and where they're needed. The United Way, Galesburg Community Foundation, Rotary Alliance, NAACP, the American Red Cross, YMCA, Triad, City of Galesburg, Knox County, the regional school districts, volunteer fire departments, local grocery stores, and there's a lot of others that I'm not naming. I want to say that this is really about community and coming together as a community. This is a message to everyone. There's no need to overshop or hoard for supplies. Our distributions of goods have not been compromised, and by hoarding or completely stripping shelves, it makes the situation worse. In many ways, the hoarding is a bigger problem than the actual event itself. It makes it much harder on our elderly population and those who don't have as much as others. I want to say, be kind to each other. Remember, we're all in this together. We have to practice social distancing, but we can still smile at each other, say hello, throw a wave out. That goes a, a long way. Thank you. At this time, any of the community partners that are within the room, uh, we will take questions and answers from this point. For about 10 or 15 minutes, we will take questions and answers. Randy, could you kind of explain what, the, what you meant when you said that the center was partially open? Can you explain that? Sure. Uh, by a partial opening of the e um, the EOC, what I mean is it's it's not staffed right now, we've got it ready to go, but because it's considered a level two emergency through the state, which just means that there are some issues going on in the state, but there's nothing going on here, what we've done is we've met as a team and we've actually set up a uh, kind of a, a little incident command and, and a structure so we're ready for anything to come here. Um, that's where we're briefing daily, we're getting together daily. If there, we do start to have issues here, we will go ahead and staff the EOC and make sure that we've got staff in that area. But uh, we just kind of call it, it's a partial stand-up, and when I do that, I just notify the state that we've done that. We've developed, the, you know, our team is together, and then they're ready for issues that can come in. When you get together and you have these meetings every day, what are, what are you talking about? What kind of goes on? We're kind of giving updates. So when I talked about the pieces together, what we're doing is we're kind of giving updates as to what's happening into our individual pieces. Because, uh, you know, there's so many, there's so many different uh, groups in the community. Sometimes I can get that messaging and get lost. So we're just community, and every, like today, there probably won't be anything. We're going to talk at the end of the day. We're going to, we're going to meet on a conference call. And, and if it's a five minute conversation, that's what it is. Uh, if we have more going on, that way we can, we can let each other know, hey, this is what's going on here, this is what's going on there. It really is about operating as one team. When you're, I mean, when you're trying to email and when you're trying to call, it makes it a lot more difficult. And so when we, when and if we do have needs, that way we can address any of those needs wherever they're at. I mean, literally, I, I wish I could have brought that board in and showed you that there's like three boards we filled up with stuff and, and we plan way down the road for anything. So. Randy, I'm also kind of curious from the, the fire department standpoint. Uh, how do you how do you deal with staffing in terms of that? And kind of, I mean, you have a bunch of firefighters that are pr practically in close quarters all the time. How do how do you deal with that from a fire standpoint? Well, right now, what we've done is we've set up a plan, just and kind of like what we did with our emergency operations plans. So we planned on down the road for different events. Uh, we have suspended any sort of commercial uh, inspections. We have it suspended any sort of uh, public education, people coming into the station. We've asked our members to not have their family members come in. Uh, so our, our lives are disrupted as well. But we're trying to do like everyone else. We're trying to, and we're, we've actually, not, we're not training right now. So we've kind of limited our contact. Uh, we've had, we're, we're practicing social distancing, distancing at the stations as well and cleaning the stations three or four times a day. I guess I'm wondering too, since I'm looking at the Chief Idol now, if he could uh, maybe kind of explain what the, the police department aspect of that would be. We've been talking about this event here for a little over a week. I just want to assure everyone that their police department is here and ready to, to serve. Uh, we'll be there to protect the public. Uh, we will keep you safe and we will be there if you call and if you need us. As far as uh, our plan is, is we're also doing uh, significant cleaning events at the police station. We've brought in extra cleaning supplies 
are keeping the rooms and, and work areas clean. We are limiting our responses as well. We're handling some calls over the phone if they don't involve a threat to personal injury or damage to property. If it's something we can handle the phone call, we're doing that to prevent contact. Um, we're still taking some enforcement actions, but uh, limiting that, that somewhat, some you know, minor traffic or things like that. Um, obviously, if you're being unsafe, we're still going to take care of business, but uh, uh, some of those things, uh, the state has uh, suspended uh, expired registrations or expired driver's license, things like that. So we're not dealing with some of those real low-level things to, so we can focus on the needs of the community. Um, we're also exercising social social distancing. Um, usually we have a shift meeting at the beginning where everyone gets together in a room and talks about what went on that day. Uh, we're doing that by email to keep, keep people separated. Um, and we have uh, plans upon plans on how to deal with uh, uh, staffing issues if we do start to get illnesses. So uh, uh, I guess my message would be is we're ready. We're here and we will be there if the community needs us. Else? I have a question for Michelle. Um, to is it uh, not to be overly alarmist, but is it uh, a guarantee that Knox County will have cases, and it's just a matter of you know flattening that curve, making sure the healthcare system doesn't get overwhelmed, or is there? I mean, is there any possibility that there won't be cases in Knox County? That I wouldn't speculate on that. There, there's still a lot of counties. There's 102 counties in Illinois, and I believe it's still limited to 15. So I believe it's important for us to do whatever we can to keep it out of the county. Um, so that that would be pure speculation on my part. I wouldn't do that. Is there any, um, since Knox County is an older population and there's maybe a disproportionate amount of people locally that are older and in the vulnerable population, does that factor into the response plan or anything you're considering at this point? It certainly does. We have 13 long-term care facilities, and we've been in direct con you know, communication with them. And at the health department, and I'm sure we will moving forward in Unified Command, we've, we've talked specifically about that we do have an older population in the community and how to get the messaging not only out to them but their loved ones for how they can care for them, how they can talk to them and say, hey, if you stay at home, I'll give you a call and see if you need anything. And I, I do think this is a caring community and people are paying special care to the 60 and older. Okay, um, are Galesburg hospitals equipped to handle an influx of patients? It is my information they are. They are both here and um, I would invite either one of them to answer the question directly or both. Lisa DeKiesel with OSF St. Mary Medical Center, and I can assure you that OSF as a ministry and OSF St. Mary here locally is preparing diligently um, on, uh, and consistently on a daily basis to ensure that we can manage the volume and the surge potential. We are working in collaboration with our community health partner, Cottage Hospital, as well as how do we work together to serve the needs of our community. And I can assure you that we do have surge plans in place should we see an influx here um, in Galesburg and in Knox County. Thanks, Lisa. I'm Bob Moore. I'm the CEO at the Galesburg Cottage. I was a couple minutes late because dealing with the issues that you deal with every day. Uh, we're prepared to. We have ICU beds. We have ventilators. Uh, our biggest concern now is keeping people out of the ER. Uh, the respiratory issues, which usually accounts for somewhere 20-25% of the cases on any given day anyway. Uh, we're trying to get them out of the ER into appropriate places, but the message, and I, I know you've already heard it, uh, people need to stay home, call their primary care physician. Uh, we're also looking at, you know, is there another number that we can set up for people to call so that if they need testing, we'll get them to the appropriate place but to stay out of the ER. But we're equipped, we have supplies, we have testing kits available, and uh, we'll handle it as this comes forward to us. I would also like to echo and thank Bob um, for um, also talking about the additional resources we have available. Um, as Cottage is working diligently to also set that information line up, OSF St. Mary Medical Center and OSF as a ministry does have a COVID hotline number that is out on all of our websites that our patients and community members are welcome to access for real-time information. We also are deploying a very 
um, large set of digital resources for our communities to get their questions answered. Um, so we have Claire, our chatbot, who actually really works very, very well as if you are really communicating with somebody truly across a phone line and she can answer a lot of questions, which will help do screening but also redirect you to the appropriate points of care because I would echo Bob's statement in the importance of ensuring screening prior to presentation um, in order to ensure that we're keeping our ERs open for those patients that really truly need um, our support and services. However, we always remain available to our community. We also have our prompt care um, available as well, so certainly we're available to you, but we purely um, want to ensure that we are um, reminding patients to call first or to access digital services to do those screening tools to get some of their basic questions answered. Can you both uh, talk a little bit about uh, visitor restrictions and things like that and kind of how you're maybe even helping employees? I heard of another hospital that basically locked every entrance except the ER entrance and that type of thing. Can you talk about all that? Yeah, let me, let me just add one thing to what Lisa said about you know calling first because our biggest concern is our staff. And if somebody presents in the ER and that exposure occurs, now we've got staff that we need there when they're needed to take care of. So that's why it's so critical to make that phone call first. Visitation, uh, we changed on Monday at Galesburg Cottage. You cannot have a visitor. Patients uh, that are coming for elective surgeries can have one person that uh, goes with them, because that's for the driver uh, capabilities. Uh, we have four entrances right now, one into our professional office building, one to our medical office building, one into the ER, which is 24-7, and then one into the main lobby, but all but the ER are closed at 5 o'clock and locked, uh, and we're looking at whether we're going to be monitoring those, you know, to check temps as well, but that's what we've done on the visitation. At OSF St. Mary, what we have done regarding visitation at this point in time, and please room, um, be reminded this is a fluid situation for Bob at Cottage and for myself and for all of our community partners that are managing this, so this can change um, minute by minute, literally. But right now, currently, visitor restrictions at St. Mary, um, we are allowing one guest per patient. However, all visitors entering through our one entrance, which is open, which is our main entrance, um, are screened at the door to ensure if they hit any of those um, high-risk areas such as recent travel or any symptoms that they may have. We are managing that and screening. Um, we are only allowing the one guest per patient at this time if they pass that screening. Our clinic doors um, remain open to our medical office building through the main entrance of the clinic to access services. That is currently being um, monitored as well. Um, and of course our prompt care is available and then our ER 24-7 of course is, is open and accessible. So I want to make sure I clarify that as well for OSF St. Mary. No further questions at this time. This concludes the press conference. Thank you.